Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings and thanks for joining us again today for the latest in our What Physicians Need to Know series about COVID-19 and other important issues in healthcare. I'm Dr. Susan Bailey, President of the American Medical Association, and in today's webinar, we will dive a little deeper into the conversation about COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy as states begin to scale up their vaccine rollout plans. Our previous webinars featured representatives from the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC to explore other aspects of COVID-19 vaccine development, allocation, and distribution. If you weren't able to join us for those sessions, I encourage you to watch replays of the videos, which are available for free on our website. You can find them at ama-assn.org backslash COVID-19 webinars, or you can simply visit our main page and search for COVID-19 webinars. Nearly a year into our collective response to COVID-19, the pandemic is more deadly and widespread than ever. Over 25 million people in the United States have become infected, and those are just the cases that have been officially recorded. It's unlikely we will ever know the true number of those infected by this virus. And sadly, this month we reached yet another grim milestone with over 400,000 deaths in the United States to COVID-19, less than a year after registering the first known death in this pandemic, and we're rapidly approaching half a million deaths in the U.S. Despite the hope that comes with two safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19 that are in the early stages of distribution, the case numbers continue to exhaust our hospitals and ICUs and put physicians and other healthcare workers at serious risk. They are truly the heroes of this moment. But so too are the scientists and researchers who have been working and continue to work around the clock to develop safe and effective vaccines in record time. As we start this new year with new leadership in the White House and a new strategy for responding to COVID-19, there is some optimism about what the next few months will bring. Now, as a specialist in allergy and clinical immunology, I can tell you that I know that physicians play an incredibly important role as vaccine ambassadors for our patients. And so to help make sure that patients have their questions answered and their concerns addressed, we need to first make sure that physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers have deep understanding of the accelerated vaccine process, the scientific rigor that got us here, and how the available vaccines performed in clinical trials are performing in the real world. So that's the basis of today's webinar. To help us understand the science and data behind the vaccines now in use and those on the way, we invited our friend, Dr. Peter Marks, back to talk to us about the vaccine process and answer questions you may have. Dr. Marks, who we featured in our initial webinar back in October and again in December, is director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. He's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. He led the Adult Leukemia Service at Yale University and served as Chief Clinical Officer of Smilo Cancer Hospital in New Haven before joining the FDA in 2012 as the center's Deputy Director. In his current role as Director, he and his team are tasked with ensuring that the COVID-19 vaccines that ultimately reach the public are both safe and effective, and that they have undergone a rigorous, evidence-based, and transparent process. Today, Dr. Marks will lead us on a deeper dive into the safety and efficacy of the authorized vaccines and to answer your questions about things like dosing schedules, new variants, and additional vaccine candidates on the horizon. We hope this information not only provides you with a greater understanding of the science behind these remarkable vaccines, but also gives you the information you need to assure your patients about the safety and reliability of the vaccines once they become available to them. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Marks. Thanks very much. So I'm gonna spend about 20 minutes uh, going through a slide presentation uh, and, uh, and then after that, uh, we will be going ahead and uh, having questions and answers. Full screen mode, there we go. Thanks very much. Then thanks 
to you for everything that you do every day. Thanks for listening in uh, today. Um, you know, FDA's role uh, it, uh, it, for vaccines is across the entire life cycle of vaccines from the time they're actually conceived um, to uh, when they're deployed. Um, we are involved early on in helping to select strains of vaccines where that's appropriate. Um, and uh, we make reference panels and reference products um, in our, our laboratories. Um, we are involved with lot release, making sure that the quality of the manufacturing is appropriate for vaccines. Um, and we do what most people think we do is evaluate vaccine safety and efficacy in applications that are submitted to us. Um, once vaccines are out on the market, we collaborate with others, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to make sure that there's good post-market surveillance so that we can detect uh, any uh, adverse events that may be occurring um, after deployment into large numbers of individuals. And we also, over the past several years, have had an increased role in trying to advance vaccine technology, learning how to make uh, vaccines in a more efficient manner uh, or in a more effective manner. Um, and uh, we do all of that ultimately with the hope of helping to uh, ensure public confidence in vaccines, because ultimately all of what we do um, is for naught if people aren't willing to take the vaccines that come through uh, the development process. So one of the things that's probably important to be able to describe to people um, is the fact that the process that was used to develop these COVID-19 vaccines was not a, it's not a process that was rushed or cut corners. It was a process uh, in which white space was taken out of the vaccine development process. Usually vaccine development is something that is done very sequentially in order to de-risk the process People don't, the companies that make these products don't make a ton of money uh, making them uh, compared to other products. And so in the development process, they tend to de-risk the process by going in orderly manner from phase one development to phase two development to phase three development. And each time there's usually a matter of months to even years that go between those stages. And they don't usually start to scale up their manufacturing processes until they're pretty sure they're gonna have a successful vaccine. That means that that process goes over the span of years. So one way that you could simply accelerate vaccine development that was just taken advantage of for these vaccines is that rather than having phase one, then two, then three, um, some of these studies were done as phase one, two, three studies, or there were phase one, two, and then phase two, three studies. And that uh, sped up uh, the process. Additionally, um, platforms that were already um, known to be relatively quick to use, such as the mRNA platforms, were taken advantage of. And so early on, that helped get things into the clinic. So by de uh, taking away some of the white space, that helped. And then a very important part of this um, was uh, that the manufacturing scale up started very early on relative to when it would normally scale up. Um, so that the idea here is that if there was a positive result at the end, there would be a fair amount of vaccine around to deploy. Now we can argue whether there was enough to deploy uh, given uh, the, uh, the need here, uh, uh, but um, uh, certainly uh, having millions of doses is better than having no doses. Um, uh, when a vaccine uh, comes through. And, and then one other thing I should say uh, about this, about uh, helping to shave down time, is that uh, normally we like to have six months or a year of follow-up at least for a vaccine, but we're able to take advantage of the fact that we've developed very good post-market surveillance systems. So that was something that was taken advantage of as well. And I'll tell you more about that. So. We have in, at FDA, we put out two guidance documents, um, and one in June and the other in October to help the manufacturers of vaccines and to help the public understand what we were expecting from the development of vaccines for COVID-19. The first kind of laid out our general expectations. 
and the second on emergency use authorization explained the process in more detail uh, for those vaccines that would be submitted. We made it pretty clear, uh, and particularly in the emergency use authorization guidance, that any vaccine would have to demonstrate clear and compelling efficacy in a large, well-designed phase three clinical trial if it was going to get the authorization um, that would have to have careful evaluation of the quality, safety, and as I've noted, the efficacy, that we would take these vaccines to public advisory committee meetings, um, and that they would all need to have enhanced post-deployment surveillance. All of this um, is uh, to make sure that people understood that the standard for an emergency use authorization uh, it, which was really developed for times like these when one has a biologic threat um, that was not present before and you need to use products that might not have been through uh, the full approval process. It was developed really with originally with the thinking of therapeutic products in mind where you were giving them to sick, to sick people. But for vaccines that are given very often to healthy people, um, we really felt that it, was, that it was necessary to articulate the fact that the standard we were using used the emergency use authorization as a floor. The standard for emergency use authorization is a product may be effective and its known and potential benefits have to outweigh its known and potential risks. And so that what we did by articulating this in our guidance was to say that, look, we're, that's the floor, but we're operating much at a much higher level, much, much closer to the ceiling of what would constitute a full approval um, by saying that we would have to have clear and compelling efficacy. And as you'll see, the clinical trials programs for these vaccines were every bit as large as most of the clinical trial programs for our approved vaccines. The safety monitoring that we're talking about after deployment is actually an overlapping set of uh, safety systems uh, by both the Centers for Disease Control and by FDA working together. And we're working actually in conjunction with other federal and non-federal partners. So we have passive monitoring systems, which include the vaccine adverse reporting system, adverse event reporting system. That's the typical MedWatch forms that people fill out. Um, uh, and that can be filled out by providers or patients or even family members. Um, uh, and we uh, uh, go through those reports. The CDC has a text-based monitoring system, the vSAFE system, that is an opt-in system whereby when you go to get vaccinated, you can opt in and uh, for several days after you're vaccinated and then on a weekly basis and then on a several monthly basis, a text message is sent to report certain adverse events. And if certain adverse events are reported, CDC actually reaches out and telephones people live back to get more information. So. Those are the passive monitoring systems, but there's also active monitoring because we want to be able to find certain things that, we, that might be very rare that we wouldn't be able to sort through otherwise. And so um, CDC has the vaccine safety data link and the clinical immunization safety assessment systems. Those cover millions of people, um, but can do so in near real time. And at FDA, we have the Sentinel best system, which now covers um, hundreds of millions of lives. Um, and um, it allows us to use claims data, which in some cases is linked to electronic health record data so that we can monitor uh, outcomes of interest. And in the case of the COVID-19 vaccines, we're monitoring about 50, 15, sorry, safety outcomes of interest. And um, that is, is very helpful because things that we might be concerned about um, uh, that, we wouldn't have the normal amount of time of a year, perhaps. We can continue to look for um, over uh, the course if some signal were to emerge. Now, just to move into the vaccine candidates, we've authorized two uh, mRNA vaccine candidates, which I'll tell you a bit more about, um, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine and the Moderna mRNA vaccine, those, were, these, those emergency use authorizations were granted in December. Um, uh, there are two non-replicating viral vector vaccines, which you probably have heard about, one by uh, AstraZeneca Oxford, um, that's the uh, chimpanzee adenoviral vectored vaccine. That is 
been deployed in certain places and uh, recently has a, a positive opinion from the uh, European health authorities. Uh, and uh, that is currently in a phase three trial in the United States. Um, the uh, Janssen vaccine, the, uh, which is a human adenovirus 26 vectored vaccine, um, uh, people may have heard, or this may be news for them today, they've released a press release about um, having a positive study um, uh, from phase three for that vaccine, um, uh, which is a one dose vaccine. All of the other do vaccines I've told you about so far are two dose vaccines. Uh, the Janssen vaccine is a one dose vaccine. FDA has not yet reviewed those data. Um, so I can't comment a lot more uh, uh, on them. I'll do my best to answer questions um, because we haven't actually reviewed the data. Uh, although we're aware of the same press releases that you probably are. Um, and then there is a protein subunit vaccines, one from Novavax and one from Sanofi. The Novavax is actually in phase three trials. The Sanofi is in phase two. Uh, the Novavax um, actually issued a press release earlier this week about their phase two, three program uh, in the United Kingdom and in uh, South Africa. Uh, again, reporting some positive results, which again, we don't have not reviewed yet at FDA, but I think the, the, the nice thing to be able to say here is that there is a portfolio of vaccines here um, that um, does seem to be uh, uh, bring uh, good uh, efficacy here. Um, certainly the mRNA vaccines I'm about to tell you about um, are appear to be very effective vaccines um, with reasonable safety profiles. And the other vaccines here are, are in various stages of evaluation. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines. Um, I, some, some people, their eyes glaze over when we talk about what's in a vaccine. But the reason why I put up this uh, is so that uh, you can understand that these two vaccines are very similar. Um, they both contain modified mRNAs. Um, they contain lipids. Uh, the lipids are slightly different. Um, uh, uh, the, they both have in common the fact though that part of them uh, are de derived versions of polyethylene glycol 2000. I'll come back to that a little later. Um, I, I can see Dr. Bailey uh, probably will, her ears will perk up there because uh, that may have to do with some of the allergic uh, uh, issues that might uh, come up. Uh, and uh, uh, then we have uh, the, uh, the, the kind of the buffers that go into these. Um, and the difference uh, for, you know, from a practical standpoint uh, for uh, these vaccines is actually storage becomes uh, something of, of an issue. Um, the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine has six doses um, uh, in relatively small volume. They're 0.3 ml doses, uh, generally should be given with a lower dead volume syringe. The vo vaccine has to be stored in an ultra cold, cold freezer, uh, minus 60 to minus 80 centigrade. Uh, the Moderna vaccine has uh, 10 doses, uh, half mil doses in their vial. It's not reconstituted like the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine uh, is. Uh, it's just drawn from the vial, and those uh, can be stored in conventional freezers. So um, uh, similar in many ways, different storage conditions, uh, different doses uh, in terms of the volumes. Uh, in terms of the trials, I told you that these were respectably sized trials. And you know, our average trial uh, for a, a, a newly authorized vaccine, the trial sizes range, average sizes are in the 20 to 30,000 range in terms of the number of individuals who have actually received the vaccine. And when you look at this, um, these were randomized trials one to one. Uh, and the Pfizer BioNTech trials, uh, about uh, you know, 43,500 some odd individuals, Moderna, 30,000. Uh, 400 some odd individuals. And you can see um, uh, that the people enrolled in these trials, we encouraged enrollment of a cross section of individuals from the United States. And indeed they manufacturers both really listened to this. Um, and so we had about 10%, we see about 10% people who characterize themselves as black or African-American, 20 to 25% or so um, Latinx, uh, and 
about 20 to 25% people over the age of 65. Those are nicely sized data sets. Um, and you can see that in both of these trials, you had enough people in the vaccine arm uh, who are over age 65 that we have a data set of over 3,000 individuals, which is what we like to see um, in a group to really feel like we're getting uh, a good uh, idea of the safety profile. Um, when we, you probably all have heard about the efficacy, you'd have to be under a rock uh, if you hadn't heard about that at this point in the United States. Um, uh, and these vaccines both have 94 to 95% uh, efficacy. They both do a very good job of preventing severe COVID-19. Um, and I think the one thing I'll point out here is that both of them, the efficacy, though it may tail off a little bit in older individuals, um, it doesn't tail off much. And that's really something that is, at least to me, when I think about these uh, mRNA vaccines, is one of the things I'm still very interested in, in better understanding because many of our vaccines, as, as one gets over age 55, the efficacy goes down pretty significantly. And that's not the case here. Very nice to have a little bit of luck here um, that these vaccines were really uh, very efficacious across the board pretty much. So uh, a nice thing to see. Um, I should say that they also are associated with some side effects. The good news is um, uh, most of the side effects have been mild to moderate. The mild to moderate side effects tend to be worse after the second injection. Uh, and you can do yourself a favor as a provider by telling people that um, because uh, it's sometimes helpful them, for them to know that after the second dose, they may have a higher chance of seeing some of the side effects. Um, injection site pain, pretty common. The other com uh, common things are very much flu-like types of symptoms, fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, um, chills, fever. Um, and again, it tends to happen more after the second dose than the first dose. Interestingly here, it tends to happen less, somewhat less in older individuals for both of the vaccines uh, than uh, in younger individuals. So younger individuals tend to experience more in, in these uh, in these symptoms, um, and I, I, I've 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 done pretty well so far um, by uh, advising people who have asked me. You know, after the day after you get your your second dose, you might not want to have um, a a full schedule planned, um, uh, or make that day the day you're going to run the half marathon, um, socially distant, of course. Um, and people have generally thanked me for that. And and then if they have nothing happen they're very grateful for that. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, no one generally has said, uh, said they're upset at me for canceling part of their virtual day. Um, one of the things that did emerge um, after uh, these vaccines were deployed um, were very shortly, within days after being deployed, uh, the United Kingdom reported some severe allergic reactions. Um, this was a great initial test of our surveillance systems our international collaboration um, uh, and our ability to sort things out because very rapidly international regulators got together. We put together the uh, data from various countries as it was as the vaccine continued to roll out. Um, and we now have a pretty good handle that um, both of the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines are associated with a, uh, an incidence of, of severe allergic reactions probably in the order of one in 100,000 to one in 200,000 individuals who receive them. That's why we have the warning that uh, they should not be administered to people who have a known history of a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or any component. If somebody's had a severe reaction to um, uh, one of these vaccines, they should not get it again unless they're under uh, the care and it's done with caution uh, of an allergist immunologist. Um, uh, we are not recommending that. Um, and really, for anyone who's getting these vaccines, it needs to be uh, in, where there's appropriate medical treatment available to manage uh, uh, severe allergic reactions. This is also a, a good kind of check on things. You know, we didn't see that when, when these allergic reactions first happened, we were really concerned, how did we miss these? But now in retrospect, what, now that we know that they're happening in one in 100,000 to one in 200,000, it's not surprising that even when you combine both of these clinical trial populations, 
you're still dealing with a small number relative um, to, uh, uh, to the incidence of this. So you just didn't probably just didn't have enough people in the clinical trials to see this. Anyway, this is a good example. We now have very good surveillance on, on going for this. Um, the CDC and FDA actually look at the number of allergic reactions on a daily basis. Um, and we sort through these and we'll continue to do similar. One of the final things I just want to spend two or three minutes on um, is it has not escaped us that vaccine confidence is very much um, something that over the past years has drifted downward. Um, and uh, there were various circumstances, which I will not go into now, um, but you can, uh, you're can you free to imagine uh, that might have happened over the past few years that probably reduced vaccine confidence more. Um, uh, and uh, some of that has to do with our social media, et cetera. But um, we decided that because it's so important that we help reestablish vaccine confidence and not just for COVID-19 vaccines, uh, for influenza vaccine and uh, for measles vaccine, tetanus, I can go on and on, right? These are vaccines that are, uh, all of our vaccines are things that have probably um, next to figuring out that you needed to keep your water supply and septic systems separate, they are probably the greatest advances of 20th century medicine. And it's a shame to have people um, not understand that and take advantage of that. So we've, uh, we actually uh, asked uh, one of the partners of FDA, there's a foundation that is, is, was created to help support um, uh, the FDA's mission, Reagan Udall Foundation, we asked them to help us by conducting listening sessions about COVID-19 vaccine concerns. And these were really unstructured sessions. The idea was what I'm trying to say, what I mean by unstructured, they were structured, but they weren't, uh, they weren't directed with questions of X, Y, or Z. They were really listening sessions um, rather than uh, directing questions and answers uh, like we sometimes do. Um, and they, we really learned a tremendous amount from these um, and including what messages appear to be uh, uh, most effective and who were the most important messengers. And it was interesting because many of us thought that there would be, you know, would be local leaders, clergy people, but it turns out that the top messengers were doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and health experts. So you make a difference when you speak to patients about uh, vaccines. Turned out that the top five messages that we learned um, uh, were that, you know, included in the important fact that, um, you know, that the, the public uh, uh, is really that sharing uh, information about COVID-19 vaccines from the FDA um, is something that FDA is doing so that people can see the evidence for themselves. Um, we, the other message was that, you know, only safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines that have been rigorously tested on tens of thousands of volunteers will be approved or authorized. Um, that scientists and career public health officials, not politicians or their appointees will decide when a COVID-19 vaccine is safe, effective and ready for public use. Um, importantly, ones that really went over very well where by getting a COVID-19 vaccine, you're protecting yourself, your children, parents, grandparents, and other loved ones. That really, that, and, and that, you can see why that might resonate with people. Um, and then uh, COVID-19 vaccine development is moving faster than normal because the medical and scientific community have made it their highest priority, not because any steps have been skipped. And so all of those things have been very helpful. And we also out of this have some, had some recommendations about giving the message. And they included that um, it really turned out that a lot of focus needs to be how you get the message out there. Um, it was very clear that um, show, don't tell. What, we meant, what was meant by that is people wanted to know, did you get the vaccine, Dr. Marks? Um, I have to be honest, I haven't yet because I'm not uh, and a frontline healthcare worker. Uh, but uh, I will soon, I hope. Um, uh, uh, tailor messages to the audience. Um, 
explain the vaccine development process. No, so you know, this is why I'm very grateful for you watching this and, and learning a little bit more about what was done here. Um, really uh, come to people and, and try to understand their concerns, uh, meet people where they are, acknowledge people's concerns and fears. Um, uh, it, it's okay to, to be a little, uh, you know, unnerved by this, uh, it's okay. Um, uh, consistently repeat the core themes, focus on the persuadables. There, it, that was an important piece because there were some people who were not gonna convince to take these vaccines, but there are people who given um, having their questions answered will be willing to take the vaccines and it's just getting over uh, the anxiety um, that comes with something unfamiliar. Um, and then uh, be ready to respond to vocal critics uh, we're here at FDA to help people with that as we can, and CDC is there as well. So um, really, I'll just conclude by saying it's really important to understand that here we've had vaccine development timelines shortened without compromising safety and efficacy. Um, we're trying to do this in as transparent a manner as we can, because we think that if people see what's gone on here and see that we are uh, trying to share in an open, truthful way, that will make a difference. Um, and we'll continue to do this as we try to address some of the additional challenges um, that are emerging, um, including the, uh, these variants that are now coming up. So I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Dr. Marks. That was uh, so interesting. As usual, um, <clears throat> I really do appreciate uh, your presentation. Uh, we again received over 100 questions, uh, very good questions for this webinar. Don't worry, I've uh, condensed them down. Uh, and some of the questions were related to the distribution of vaccines, uh, which is really outside of FDA's purview. So uh, we won't be able to cover those questions here. And I know that those are very pressing, important questions now uh, about vaccine availability. Um, we got a whole bunch of questions about the new variants that have been discovered, the B117, B1135, um, and others. Um, um, what do we know? We've heard that there is some efficacy uh, against these new variants. Can you tell us what we, what the state of knowledge is today about efficacy against the new variants? Right. So we know that at least there's work been done uh, in vitro. In other words, laboratory work done that seems to indicate that the mRNA vaccines should maintain efficacy uh, against the the most, most of these variants, and particularly the one that people are quite concerned about, the B1351 uh, variant, which is also the 501 uh, V2 variant. They go by two different names, same, same, same variant, two different names. Um, uh, but we don't have the clinical data there yet. Um, the, the, it's, this, is, this, this determination was based on the, uh, the titers uh, that would take to neutralize um, and what's achieved uh, with the mRNA vaccines. Um, I, I know that the manufacturers of both vaccines are working very actively on getting additional data here um, because this is obviously uh, really top of mind for us at this point and understanding these variants and others uh, are, are very important. You know, with the, the, especially the mRNA vaccines, um, you know, I would, you know, those were able to be ramped up so quickly once we had the, the RNA sequences uh, that I would hope that um, new vaccines for that would be more effective against new variants would also be able to be ramped up pretty quickly. Is that true? So great question. So I think the, the issue I think you're asking, if I understand is, if we were to need, if, if, if somehow the, the, the variants were to get far enough off that we felt that the current vaccine was not effective, could we shift over to uh, uh, same vaccine platform, but a different sequence uh, to, uh, to address or a different virus uh, viral vector to address that? Is that, is that correct, Dr. Bailey? Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. you're asking. Yeah. So um, we have been uh, trying to, Think about this for a while because I think what we learned very early on as we started to see variants emerge was there was the potential that this could happen, right? This was, and, and because of that, we're not going to get caught off guard. Um, so we started to put together our thoughts 
about what this might look like. And we basically now, I think, have are in the process of working with our industrial and federal partners to essentially put together a playbook for how this will look um, if we need to switch over uh, to a different sequence. With the mRNA, it's very convenient because basically all you do is change a computer program and the synthetic uh, that, 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 that for the synthesizing uh, portion of this, and you can change the vaccine. Um, but the question is, what do we need from the, uh, from the FDA perspective to feel comfortable having that deployed? And what I can say is we're working on kind of finalizing what that will look like, but it, I can tell you what it will not require. It will not require another uh, clinical trial for efficacy. It will probably require some small clinical trials um, uh, to just make sure that, that the, the vaccines are immunogenic, that they produce an immune response against these new variants, and that we can understand whether the protection against that new variant does it only cover the new variant uh, and, or does it also cover the old variant? Because that will help us understand whether we can have something that's like a strain change. That is, do we change to one, uh, one new vaccine or are we gonna have to have multivalent vaccines where we have the new strain and, or the new variant and the original or wild type uh, uh, virus also covered. And Which that, is what that's, we do that's with why flu vaccines, yeah. 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 So, okay. Um, so you won't have to go through a completely new clinical trial. Um, will the, the authorization process be the same? It sounds like it will be very, very condensed. It, we, would, we would assume to have a pretty streamlined process. Um, it's possible we'll go to our advisory committee to make sure that um, uh, they're comfortable with the data the first time. And my guess is the first, if we have to do this, the first times we'll do it, we're going to probably try to understand how to do it. And, uh, and, and it may be that with time, we will need even less data. Um, uh, but the first couple times we do it, we may require some, we'll probably require some clinical study. Uh, but as I say, not with an efficacy endpoint but more likely with an, uh, uh, an immune response endpoint. And it probably will not be very, very large studies. There'll probably be studies involving uh, a few hundreds of people, not thousands of people. Again, to make sure that what we deploy something, it's doing what it says it is, and also so that we can understand some of these features of the immune response. So we would intend to try to be pretty nimble with this. So. Um, uh, as, as nimble as one can be when you're dealing with a large infrastructure like vaccine manufacturing uh, so that we get the, these variants covered as quickly as possible because it is clear that they can spread pretty quickly. Yes. Um, now, you mentioned uh, this morning's uh, press release about the, the Johnson & Johnson um, safety and efficacy data on their single-dose vaccine. Um, claiming around 70, 72% efficacy. Uh, and of course, the media is already saying, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is a failure compared to 95% efficacy for Pfizer and Moderna. You know, and I know you can't say a whole lot specifically about um, you know, the, the, that the, and the Novavax uh, vaccine, but how, how sh but we're going to get questions from our patients about it. And so how, um, how do we discuss this with our patients uh, in terms of, you know, comparing 70% versus 90% efficacy? You know, how do we reassure our patients? Um, how do we recommend which vaccine they should get, you know, as the new vaccines come online? Yeah. So first of all, let's. I, I would. I would say that as we hear these uh, these vaccine figures, let's all take a deep breath first, because this is these are company reports, not verified um, uh, uh, data by FDA. And there sometimes are changes that occur after uh, we go through and and look at case adjudications and other things. That said, I do think that if there is a difference here. Um, we will, this will come out at, through our advisory committee meeting process. Both, any of these vaccines will come if they're submitted for emergency use authorization, and I probably expect they will be. Um, 
They will go to a public advisory committee. Uh, there will be a discussion of the various data, the various subsets of, of individuals who seem to uh, benefit more and benefit less. Um, and I think it's too early to be able to really tell your patients, well, this is a failure or a success because we, we need as many tools as we can here. So it may turn out that these vaccines provide us with a very good vaccine in a certain population of patients. And right now, if you, know, if you had a population of patients that could get, you know, that could very get very nicely 75 or 80% efficacy with any vaccine, I'm not talking about any specific one that, were, that was mentioned today, but you, you with a single dose vaccine, you might say, well, if we can get people with very minimal side effects and get people vaccinated quickly, that might be a good tool to have um, if, if it can help bring us towards herd immunity uh, more quickly. So I think, um, and, and this is just, uh, I'll offer this up. When you're in a situation like we are now with so much uncertainty um, and with so much need to get this pandemic under control, I think we can't ignore any tool um, in the tool chest. So we'll have to think about these, look at them. Um, I think we will have to do our best to try to make sure that we find the populations that benefit the most from each of these vaccines and deploy them in a very thoughtful manner. Um, I do think we have to be very cautious for vaccine confidence, not to let anyone think that they are getting an inferior vaccine uh, for some reason, just because they are who they are. We need to make sure that people feel that they're making a choice perhaps um, that, uh, that if you have very good data in a given population, they may choose that, well, I can get this earlier and get it right now. It doesn't seem to be associated with as many side effects and I'm willing to take five, 10 or whatever your individual uh, risk profile is percent less chance that it, 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 it protects me. So I think that's the kind of conversations that we'll have to be having it's just a little early. And as I say, unfortunately, my crystal ball today is at the repair shop. So I can't tell you exactly how those discussions are going to end up uh, after our advisory committee meeting. Okay. Um, do you have another advisory committee meeting scheduled yet for the, the next batch of vaccines? Stay tuned. Stay okay. tuned. Uh, stay tuned. Um, uh, it, it, it's probably in the not too distant future. Um, we'll see that happening. Okay. Now, at, so at what point will the FDA stop using the EUA process for new vaccines? You know, when is it no longer an emergency? Uh, and at what point will uh, the FDA demand that um, a currently available vaccine actually be the comparator group for new vaccines that are coming on as opposed to placebo? Yeah, great, great. Great set of questions. Let me unpack them a little bit. Um, uh, for right now, um, and until we have approved vaccines, uh, that ones where we've received a biologics license application, and that includes when a biologics license application is submitted, it includes having all of the manufacturing information, which includes having multiple lots of the vaccine manufactured and, and characterized and all the data wrapped up. Um, until we have that, we will probably continue to do uh, these emergency use authorizations, bringing them to advisory committees. Um, uh, uh, to the extent that um, uh, these trials can be conducted without an active comparator, um, uh, at, at this point, I think we would continue to see them uh, see that. And it seems like at least this first wave um, is managing to make its way through uh, without having uh, a, 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 an active comparator. Um, uh, but um, it is, uh, 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 it's, uh, it's something where we have really encouraged the manufacturers that after they have their emergency use authorization, they should soon after start to think about their biologics license application. Um, and, you know, that is, something that they are gonna be submitting probably for each of the ones that have come through so far, probably within the next few months we expect. So we'll, we'll expect to be seeing those. 
um, and then we'll we'll get those vaccines. Then they will be approved, and um, that will then. I, I there again, I, my crystal ball. I don't have it. That might change the development of future vaccines, but I can't say exactly how. Emergency use authorization is so a great tool that we've had in a public health emergency because it did help us really make very broadly available the vaccines without the need for in written informed consent, which is what we'd have to do if it was some big expanded access program, um, or the need for the vaccines to get all the way through the approval process, which really is quite a, it's, it's quite a lot of uh, uh, requirements because we, we generally want our vaccines to make it through a rigorous process. So it's a nice way of having them a, a relatively rigorous process, but not have to go through all of the administrative paperwork um, and some of the requirements that might have slowed things down. Thank you. Um, lots of questions about vaccines in pregnant women or women that are breastfeeding. Um, we know the WHO announced this week they weren't recommending the Moderna vaccine for pregnant women. Uh, CDC recommendations seem to be different. Uh, can you discuss the use of these vaccines in pregnant women, uh, breastfeeding women, um, and or women that are just of childbearing age that are thinking about becoming pregnant in the near future? Yeah, let, let me start with the easiest one. Uh, if you're a woman of childbearing age and thinking about becoming pregnant, I would, I would say it's absolutely reasonable to get the vaccine. That's what they did in the clinical trials. They deliberately enrolled women who were uh, not pregnant, who were of childbearing age, who might get pregnant. And so I think there, it's a very simple one. Um, and and uh, there were, uh, there's no evidence, granted small numbers, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing striking in an adverse way from those trials. Um, for pregnant women, this has been uh, kind of, the, the press gets uh, very excited about the differences between WHO and what we have from CDC. Um, remember that WHO tends to, they, they have a, a different constituency than we do in the United States. I think we in the United States have healthcare providers like you who are listening, who are capable of having benefit risk discussions with individuals um, that are relatively uh, deep and meaningful. And I think for a, if I had a pregnant woman in the office, I think I would have a conversation about the risks of COVID-19 when you were pregnant um, versus the uh, risk, the unknown as of yet risk of an mRNA vaccine, which so far um, has not been associated with any adverse effects on pregnancy that we know of. Um, now, there are hundreds of women now that are entered into a registry and will be following uh, them, CDC will be following them. Uh, so I think that's a, it's a provider patient conversation there um, and risk to benefit. And it's some people have a more difficult time living with uncertainty, not knowing that's, that's absolutely fine. But for those who feel like the risk, they understand that the risk of COVID-19 presents to a pregnancy, they may decide that um, the, it's, it's very reasonable to take the vaccine. Um, lactation has been another one that's been uh, a, uh, uh, one that's been a little challenging to deal with. Uh, you know, these, these vaccines, just so we understand the science here, when you, these, these are injected into muscle. They probably, the mRNA leads to the expression of protein on cells, probably for somewhere in the order of a day, day and a half at most. Uh, those, uh, the antigens are presented uh, to the immune system um, where they uh, go to work. Um, the, the, it's not like they, these, these mRNAs are largely circulating. Um, uh, and so, uh, there has been some suggestion that this is, again, a, if a woman is lactating, a benefit risk. Some people uh, have suggested that it, you know, for the day or two uh, after the vaccine to have prepared by pumping breast milk, and then after two or three days after the vaccine, it's reasonable to go back and, uh, and, and start uh, nursing again. I don't have a specific recommendation from FDA on this, um, but again, I think the most important thing is that conversation between uh, patient and provider, because I, again, when we don't have evidence, some people, um, uh, uh, that bond of, of breastfeeding is so important to them uh, that 
Uh, it's very disturbing to have that interrupted and they're willing to take uh, the risk. Others might say, well, okay. So I think it, it, is, it, is, it is a luxury that we have here. Um, and so I don't think, again, I don't think WHO has to deal with situations that have to be a little bit more um, automatic in, in nature. Whereas I think we have the luxury of having wonderful healthcare providers that can have these conversations. Great. Um, lots of questions about dosing schedules. Um, what um, should the dosing schedule be increased because we don't have enough vaccines? Um, is there any you know, data to support that this is okay? Uh, if you miss your second dose, um, how much protection do you have from the first dose? Um, so lots of questions. Just go ahead. <laughs> Great questions. I'll start here. Uh, so I, you know, there ideally people will get these these vaccines according to the the dosage and schedule that they should. I when you have something that gives you a ninety five percent success rate, you want to try to get that, and you want to try to you don't want to try to mess with success, and you also want to try to do things right on the first try. Um, uh, so ideally, you get it right, but it, life things happen. I don't think uh, FDA, I think, uh, and, and CDC are in complete agreement that if, if the second dose has to be delayed it's, it, and it's delayed, we, we feel like up to six weeks is okay if it has to be. Ideally, it's not, okay? Uh, but um, we would not uh, recommend ever intentionally delaying that second dose, okay? That's just in the event that it is, um, uh, uh, it's not unreasonable to give that second dose if the person comes back at six weeks instead of at four weeks. Um, but we would not recommend, as I've heard, you know, some people are they're, they're, they're because of the, the scarcity, have, we've heard of scheduling uh, at six weeks out, we would certainly not recommend intentionally doing that because although we have some data on people at, in, in that range, that's not how the clinical studies were done. And, and additionally, it may not be providing that individual with the additional protection that they might have from getting vaccinated on schedule. So it is a challenge because of the vaccine supply issues, but hopefully those are gonna get, be getting better. Um, uh, we do not think that it's a good idea at all to do mix and match vaccines. So we would try absolutely our best not to have to mix and match the vaccines um, the really the only time that you might end up that way is if somebody had they, they had absolutely no idea you couldn't get records of what they got the first time then you're going to end up giving them uh, whatever vaccine happens to be there the second time but really we shouldn't be mixing and matching these because again it, it's a little bit I know I'm starting to sound grandmotherly why mess with success you know you've got something that's really working well there um, I think most of us were really incredibly happy to see, I mean, beyond our, some of our, uh, our highest expectation that we've seen these really high uh, efficacy of the mRNA vaccines, we should try to keep them up there by giving them appropriately. Um, and this concept of maybe I'll give a half dose or maybe I'll give just one dose, that's probably not a good idea. This one dose idea for these mRNA vaccines is really one that personally disturbs me because we really, they, people have looked at some of the data and said, oh, well, one dose seems to give some protection. We don't know the duration of that protection because in the clinical trials, nearly everyone in the Pfizer trial and over 90% of the people in the Moderna trial got two doses of the vaccine at the end of the day. So we know kind of in the middle how people did with one vaccine, but when you see in the long run, we don't know how long the duration of protection will be if people just get one vaccine. So in summary, 
dose according to the schedule. Stick to the schedule. All right. Um, well, in the few minutes that we have left, I want to dig in a little bit into uh, allergic reactions, of course, being that's what I do every day, and uh, just side effects in general. Uh, the polyethylene glycol um, aspect, um, I, you know, I personally have had a patient that had anaphylaxis to um, a bowel prep for colonoscopy, and and then based on history, I could he I just diagnosed him with a, a peg allergy. Uh, I wish I could remember his name because it was before we had our EMR, and I would he's probably not a good candidate for these initial vaccines. But um, but another ingredient, the polysorbate eighty, I think has also been um, implicated. Um, and now my understanding is is that 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 PEG is not a common ingredient in vaccines typically, but polysorbate 80 is fairly common in vaccines as well as other injectable drugs. Um, so, you know, tell us a little bit, whatever you can about this. Uh, no, this is a great question. We still don't know what the actual allergen is. And we actually have studies are going on um, both by the government and uh, in academics to try to understand whether it is um, polyethylene glycol or PEG, uh, the, or uh, also known as PEG, or whether it's polysorbate. They're very, they're, they're both in that same category of, of molecules that we tend to see these allergic reactions. Um, uh, and uh, it, the reason for, the intriguing reason for polyethylene glycol is it's in common in, the, in both of these um, uh, vaccines. Um, and it's, you're right, it's not in a ton of parenteral, but it is in some parenteral um, uh, drugs. Um, and you're right, polysorbate is in some vaccines. It turns out though that polyethylene glycol exposure, we get it now through laxatives. Uh, besides, besides bowel preps, there are some now more common over the counter laxatives <clears throat> which people get exposed. And it turns out, and we're not really sure about the significance of this, I, and this was pointed out to me, uh, many uh, cosmetics, particularly facial cosmetics, the thickeners, the things that like tend to uh, get rid of wrinkles, the, the thing that makes them thick is one of the things that helps them is polyethylene glycol derivatives. So um, that may also be a source of, of exposure. And it's very intriguing to us because although allergic reactions tend to be more common in women, in this particular case, when we go through the databases, they are in this for this case, they are overwhelmingly, um, overwhelmingly occurringly in women. Uh, so um, it's intriguing. We don't know, but it's it's just one of those intriguing things. Um, so lots of work getting done, uh, looking for they're actually looking for IgE to the the polyethylene glycol um, in various studies. We'll look forward to hearing about that. Um, a physician reported that he experienced Bell's palsy after his first dose. We know there were reports of that, especially with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Um, should he get the second dose? Um, what are the thoughts on that? That's a discussion to be had with his, his provider. That's a, that's a, and it would. It, my guess is it would also depend on whether the Bell's palsy is completely resolved. But I think it would probably be a, a discussion. Uh, discussion with the provider. We we don't have any evidence yet that there is an increased incidence of Bell's palsy with these vaccines over what we see in general. So it's very hard to make a firm recommendation. So I think it's got to be that has to be an individual patient provider um, discussion of benefit risk um, uh, because we don't we as I say that we this is one of these things that we're querying our databases for. We're, we're actually globally uh, pooling the data uh, to try to get as much information as we can. Um, and so far, nothing seems like it's so distinctly different from uh, the baseline rates for uh, Bell's palsy uh, to make us uh, think that that's related to the administration of the vaccine. Well, um, thank you. Um, other questions that I would love to ask, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Uh, I, Dr. Marks, I want to thank you again. I want to thank our audience again for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Marks, your expertise has just been uh, 
continues to be amazing. Um, it What amazes me is our first webinar was only three months ago, uh, right the day after the EUA process for um, vaccines uh, had been released. And now here we are with two having been given to millions of people and looking at their third and fourth vaccines. So it's just uh, mind boggling the amount of work that the FDA has done. And thank you. We are so grateful. And for our audience, we have additional webinars in the works. So uh, we'll, of course, keep you apprised of future dates, topics, and events. And until then, thank you for all your wonderful questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. We wish you good health today and in the months ahead. Thank you for joining us. 